Hey guys, this is Aditya. Um, this is definitely not my podcast, so uh, I will let Amog take it away. <laughs> hey guys, it's Amog, and today we're going to be talking about the digestive system from a basic science perspective. The first thing we're going to do is take a hitchhiker's guide through the digestive tract, um, kind of a brief, quick, easy overview of where food goes from our mouths into the toilet, and also a brief overview of some of the pathology that we'll be talking about um, in terms of uh, different types of diseases that you might see in different parts of the GI tract. Okay, so this image is basically uh, kind of your kind of basic anatomy. Uh, when we first eat, obviously food goes into our mouths. Um, the digestive process actually starts with the salivary glands releasing something called salivary amylase, um, which is a digestive enzyme that starts the digestion process uh, directly in the mouth and eventually our food basically goes down the esophagus and into the stomach where the rest of digestion really um, is completed. Um, essentially the stomach will, will basically have a whole bunch of these digestive juices um, which are comprised of pancreatic enzymes. Our pancreas makes um, these digestive enzymes mainly to digest things like proteins and carbohydrates in the stomach itself. And the stomach really um, is kind of the center of that digestive process. Once our kind of food has been broken down into macromolecules, it's going to pass into the duodenum, which is right here, which is the first part of the small intestine, um, which is where kind of the beginning of the absorption process takes place. Um, so what, what, what you can think of is the kind of upper um, GI tract, so the mouth, esophagus, stomach are mainly kind of focused on digestion and everything below that is really focused on absorption, right? It makes sense. Once we eat, we want to be able to absorb uh, the, the things that we've eaten. So that process really starts in the duodenum and will continue essentially um, from the duodenum into the various parts of the small intestine, including the jejunum and the ileum, um, and eventually emptying into the large intestine or the colon, um, which is main function is to absorb water um, back out of, of the GI tract um, which results basically in stool, which we get rid of. So there are a few other, other things here that are pictured, uh, mainly the um, gallbladder and the kind of bile ducts, which kind of drain into the uh, intense intestines and specifically the duodenum. And the gallbladder is really responsible for holding bile that's made by the liver, um, and the bile really helps emulsify um, you know, the food, the digestive products that, we, that have gone through the dig digestion process and kind of facilitate the absorption of specifically fats, uh, which are not very easily absorbed. Bile basically helps the absorption process um, occur in the intestines. Um, so it's important to know that the gallbladder is going to be kind of like our store of bile, and whenever we eat, kind of pump out some bile into the intestines to kind of help absorb the rest of our fats. Okay, so many of you are probably familiar with this kind of basic process uh, we talked about in physiology, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail there. Okay. So, kind of zoning in on each part of the GI tract and talking about some of the uh, pathology that, that um, is most common. I think really starting in the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus is uh, really kind of a transportation uh, organ. There's not a whole lot of absorption happening, not a lot of digestion happening. Um, the main purpose is to connect the mouth to the stomach. Um, but because of that, uh, because of its close relationship with the stomach, um, one of the most kind of common diseases that we talk about with the esophagus is, is gastroesophageal reflux, um, also known as heartburn. And what happens here is that our stomach, which is releasing uh, all sorts of digestive enzymes and acid mainly um, to acidify the contents um, of, to kind of facilitate the digestive process, um, some of that acid can actually get back into the esophagus. And the esophagus is lined with uh, different types of epithelium depending on where you are in the esophagus, whether you're in the upper part or the lower part of the esophagus. And what can happen is that that acid can actually damage that part of the epithelium. And many times, um, this, is, this is a really common condition, a lot of people will have it, um, and it's, it's really important to basically be able to recognize this as, as a cause of potentially someone coming in with, with belly pain because they can actually have um, a lot of pain because of that acid reflux coming back into the esophagus. Okay. Uh, many of you maybe have even experienced it before, um, but it's kind of a very, very basic thing to be aware of when we're talking about the esophagus. Now, kind of moving downward, we're talking about 
kind of the digestive organs and then the beginnings of the absorption process, the stomach, duodenum, and pancreas. Uh, as I said before, right, what's happening is our food is coming down from the esophagus into the stomach where we have all sorts of digestive juices coming, th coming together, um, breaking down those food products into macromolecules. Um, and what can happen is that if we have a lot of acid secretion in the stomach, if, if uh, again, all of these organs are lined by epithelium, if that epithelium ever gets disrupted, and there's a lot of different ways that things can, can, think things can get disrupted, um, mainly uh, related to acid secretion and acid kind of eating away at the epithelium, um, we can develop ulcers, both in the stomach and also in the first part of the duodenum. Um, this is something that can also present with belly pain because it can be very painful. It can cause some bleeding, uh, just generalized discomfort, and um, it's a kind of really important cause of, of belly pain that is incredibly, incredibly common. Another thing that can happen in this kind of general region is pancreatitis. Now, pancreatitis basically refers to the inflammation of the pancreas, um, basically due to the pancreas secreting these digestive enzymes, and instead of breaking down food, it actually starts to digest itself. Now, this can happen uh, due to a variety of things, whether it's obstruction um, in the biliary tract because the pancreas and the gallbladder are connected by a series of ducts, and if there's ever an obstruction in one part of the duct, it can cause uh, backflow and basically decreased flow into the organ, and the pancreas can get angry and get inflamed. Um, you can also have alcohol, which can be a cause of pancreatitis, just really causing the pancreas to get um, kind of worked up secreting its enzymes over and over again to basically um, start eating itself. And there's a variety of other kind of crazy causes of pancreatitis, but um, the important thing to know is that really what's happening is that the pancreas is secreting its enzymes and the enzymes are actually breaking down the organ itself instead of working out the food that it's supposed to be happening. So um, again, in this general area we're talking about ulcers, peptic, referring to the stomach, uh, duodenal ulcers, referring to the first part of that small intestine, and also pancreatitis. Um, and again, the general concept here, both um, with reflux uh, in the esophagus and these ulcers and pancreatitis is that we have organs that are comprised of different types of epithelium and tissues that are getting inflamed. And that can be either due to um, acid secretion, it can be due to, to, to infection, it can be to obstruction. There's a lot of different things that can be causing um, this type of abdominal pain and they're all going to be presenting with abdominal pain. So it's really important to consider all of these things when we're talking about someone coming in with belly pain. And Adithya will go through that in his podcast as well. Kind of staying in this general picture, but kind of moving in this general direction uh, when we're talking about the gallbladder, there's a few different things that can, call, that can happen in the gallbladder as well. Um, remember I said that the gallbladder is responsible for holding bile that's made by the liver. As you can see, you have the liver has these hepatic ducts that'll produce a bile that'll kind of stick it in the gallbladder for storage and whenever we eat the gallbladder will be responsible for releasing that bile into the stomach and into the intestines. Now sometimes we can develop stones in the gallbladder and as you can see it's not a very big space so if we have a stone that gets stuck in here it can cause some localized inflammation and that's going to cause a lot of pain. Um, so we can, you can have a patient who will come in um, really kind of relatively healthy otherwise and they'll be presenting with belly pain and this is one of the things you want to be, want to be thinking about um, mainly because anyone can really develop gallstones. Typically the risk factors are associated with women usually in their middle age. Um, if they're obese they have a much higher likelihood of developing gallstones but really this has to do with just the fact that we have bile that's kind of sitting in the gallbladder. It's not moving around a whole lot and so as you know, when we're talking about fluids in the body, when they're kind of sticking or st staying in one place and they're, they're kind of hanging out, not doing much, they have the, the tendency to precipitate or solidify and cause obstruction. So you can present uh, with gallstones uh, with, with abdominal pain. Related to that is um, if you have a stone and a stone is kind of sitting here, sometimes because it's going to cause some obstruction of the gallbladder itself, the gallbladder itself can actually get inflamed and you can actually get infected in that area as well. And that's called cholecystitis. Chole referring to gallbladder, cyst meaning kind of, uh, cholecyst referring to the gallbladder, and then itis as inflammation. So infl inflammation of the gallbladder. Um, so cholecystitis is usually due to gallstones, and it really just refers to the inflammation of that organ uh, due to obstruction and, and subsequent infection. So again, kind of common themes. We're talking about organs, um, kind of 
solid organs in our bodies that are getting inflamed and they can all present with this type of abdominal pain. Um, so again, they're really, really important to kind of include in your differential. As we kind of move down the GI tract, uh, through the duodenum, through the jejunum, and the ileum, um, and into the, the, the large intestine or the colon, there are two main things that I want to talk about here. Um, the first is appendicitis. Some of you might have already had appendicitis previously. Now the appendix is, again, this organ that kind of sits right in the small intestine. It's a vestigial organ. We have really no use for it. Uh, but sometimes that organ, like all of the other organs we've talked about, can get inflamed. Um, there's a few different causes for this. Sometimes it can be just impacted stool that gets stuck, causing an obstruction, really basically resulting in an infection. Um, it's kind of in a weird location, so um, it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to to always uh, identify in terms of a, a kind of like a stool or a, basically a rock stool. It's called a fecalith. A rock made of stool getting stuck there. Um, that's usually what the cause is in, in, in children. Um, but the appendix can get inflamed and eventually um, can cause some pretty serious abdominal pain. And, and this is actually an acute emergency. It needs to be operated on pretty quickly um, because the appendix can actually rupture, um, causing inflammation of the abdominal cavity as a whole, which we call peritonitis. Now, um, this again is a surgical emergency, so the appendix would need to get removed as soon as possible, um, and uh, the patient would need to be treated accordingly, kind of covering with antibiotics and things like that to make sure that there's no subsequent infection. Kind of a similar concept, um, but kind of in, in the rest of the colon, would be something called diverticulitis. Now, you may have heard of, of diverticulitis and diverticulosis. Diverticulosis basically refers to um, kind of little outpouchings that form in the colon as a result of stool kind of pushing through this area and the, steer, the sheer stress of that stool pushing through the colon can actually create these outpouchings of mucosa um, called diverticuli. Now normally uh, you know, diverticuli are pretty common um, it's kind of result of, of, of aging uh, over time the more and more you kind of push stool through the colon the more and more these things can kind of pop out uh, but they only really become a problem um, when they get inflamed or infected, like any of the organs we've talked about above. So uh, these little outpatients can get infected, they can get inflamed, mainly because the blood supply to these diverticuli gets kind of disrupted because they're outpatchings in the colon and not normal parts of the colon. Um, so the blood supply can get kind of iffy, um, and basically they can get acutely inflamed, infected, and cause a pretty serious amount of pain, pretty similar to that of the appendix, although... The appendix is typically localized to the right side. If you're thinking about the image of the body, um, the appendix is going to be on the right lower quadrant of the abdomen, whereas diverticuli are usually occurring on the left side of the colon, so they're usually going to present with left lower quadrant pain. Um, but the risks are, are very similar. These diverticuli, if they get inflamed enough, uh, they can rupture and cause that same type of generalized abdominal wall um, and abdominal cavity inflammation called peritonitis. Um, and so that can be a very serious thing um, to, to, to deal with. Again, peritonitis would be, would be a kind of emergent condition that needs to be managed um, very, very quickly. So again, the common theme between all of these different conditions that we've talked about is the inflammation of kind of solid viscous organs, whether it's the, in the esophagus causing GERD, uh, inflammation in the stomach or duodenum causing ulcers, um, localized inflammation of the pancreas due to, to kind of excessive secretion, um, or if we're talking about inflammation, localized inflammation of the gallbladder due to stones uh, and a resulting infection, cholecystitis, um, as well as when we're talking about the colon, talking about appendicitis and diverticulitis. Okay, so again, this is a brief overview, and um, we will go into more detail later on. Thanks.